Welcome to Unload and Show Clear, powered by Matt Shark. Listener ready? Stand by. Welcome to another episode of Unload and Show Clear, a podcast about the men and women who compete in IDPA matches around the world. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey. IDPA, International Defensive Pistol Association, was formed out of the concealed carry movement in the United States back in the late 1990s based on the founder's desire for a sport based on real-world defensive skills and not fancy equipment. IDPA matches are a series of stages that are based on realistic defensive scenarios and a test of a shooter's gun handling, accuracy, speed, and problem-solving skills. Men and women from around the world compete in IDPA every week, and you're going to meet one of those great people today. And for 2020, Unload and Show Clear is powered by Matt Shark. If you watch videos from the um, 2019 IDPA World Championship, for example, you'll see shooters who had to deal with the discomfort of shooting in sometimes heavy rain. Now, if you were at that match or with me at the 2019 Arkansas State match, you know how much fun shooting a match in the rain can be. Pasting and scoring targets is even more fun You can't see the scoring zones, the pasters don't stick, the targets eventually disintegrate. Contrast the Arkansas State targets to the World Championship targets, and there was a huge difference, and that difference was Matt Shark. Matt Shark's patent-pending target shields keep targets dry even in heavy rain. They are reusable. The cost of the shields is quickly recovered by simply patching and reusing the shields over and over again. That reduces the number of times the targets have to be replaced too, and it makes your staff happier because setup and scoring and teardown are easier. It also makes the shooters happier because they can see the targets and they can easily pace them. Designed and manufactured right here in the United States, owned and operated by Will and Chris Schmied, whom you've heard here on this show, who are IDPA shooters themselves and experienced match directors, They understand the challenges that match staff face when dealing with bad weather. So let them help you run your matches faster and smarter and make it a better experience for your safety officers and your shooters. Visit MatchShark.com today. Get everything you need to be prepared for your next rainy day match. Spring's coming up, and we all know what that means. Lots of rain in the forecast for your match days. Be prepared. Visit MatchShark.com and find out more about their awesome products. And we are so excited that they are a part of this show this year. All right, now let's meet today's guest. Our special guest tonight is Lee Turner from Valdosta, Georgia. Lee, welcome to the show. Well, I appreciate you having me. Well, thank you for taking the time to do it. Uh, we've I've had the the pleasure of shooting with you this year and seeing you at several matches and I'm just I'm I'm happy that you took the time to to come on the show. Tell us a little about yourself for those who don't know you. What do you do for a living there in Valdosta? Well, I'm retired from the United States Air Force. I retired in 1995 and then operated my own small computer business until I retired from that in 2007. So I officially no kidding retired at 47 and um I'm just kind of enjoying the retired life. I've done a couple of little things. I worked at Gander Mountain for just a little bit, but uh, right now I'm primarily retired and probably as busy now as I was when I worked. <laughs> so you retired twice. Which is typical. <laughs> I retired twice. And um, so I'm, uh, I kind of manage our shooting range. I'm the secretary and treasurer of the Little River Sportsman's Association. I spend a lot of time uh, with our local matches and, and traveling to matches where where I met and saw you for the first time. I think it was at Memphis is where we met the first time. That's correct. And um, it's uh, so I, I do the I do the carny thing, running around uh, <laughs> matches uh, around the United States and uh, having a good time doing that. Uh, and then I do, I do a, a couple of volunteer things uh, here in Valdosta. I'm a member of the Valdosta Lowndes County Airport Authority, and I'm the president of Camp Tiger, which is our uh, our local church uh, camp uh, here in uh, just north of Valdosta. Very cool. The carny life. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Originally from... Uh... Some people do it to... Oh, go ahead. From Valdosta. I, 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 no, I'm not originally from Valdosta. I'm originally from East Texas. 
but I joined the military and traveled all over the uh, all over the world uh, from Europe uh, um, and uh, all around the United States. And uh, my last assignment was at Moody Air Force Base here in Valdosta, and retired and uh, found that uh, this was a good place for retirees to live. Uh, and it had everything that I needed. So we didn't uh, even consider moving uh, after retirement. Uh, started my own business. And um, it's been very successful, uh, or it was very successful. And um, and this is where we've chosen to, to retire. Nice. So originally from East Texas, what part? A little town called Love Lady, Texas. Uh, if you look at a map, it's halfway between Bryan College Station and Lufkin, East and West. And halfway between Houston and Dallas, north and south. Gotcha. It's a little town of 488 people, and I live 13 <laughs> miles from that town. So uh, I jokingly tell people we had to go towards town to hunt. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so growing up hunting, I guess, um, is that where you were introduced to guns as a kid? Pretty, pretty much. Um, the uh, you, you ask a, a lot of your guests how they got started, and it's funny because we lived in Indiana for a little bit, and uh, when we moved back to East Texas from Indiana, uh, the company that my dad worked for moved us back. So we had a moving company and three guys that, that packed up all of our worldly belongings into a big moving truck and moved us back to East Texas. And when they got to East Texas, the truck broke. And I mean, it broke hard and uh, it was going to take like a week. They had to replace the motor, the transmission. They had to replace some big part. It was going to take like a week. Oh. And my mom and dad being the hospitable people that they were said, Hey, we've got room. We've got a cabin. Uh, we've got uh, spare bedrooms. Uh, you guys don't have to get a hotel, you know, come live the home life as opposed to the hotel life. <laughs> and so they did. And the second day they were there, they said, where can we go buy some 22 shell? They went into town and I think they bought every 22 shell that, that they could find and came out and took me and my brother and my dad. And we went to the Creek and I think we shot the entire week. And that was my real first exposure to having a whole lot of fun shooting. And, um, my grandfather bought me a, uh, no, he didn't buy it. He found it. Uh, they owned rental property, and he gave me a 16-gauge Winchester Model 12 shotgun Ooh. that he found in one of their rental houses after uh, the the hippie rental renters moved out. And uh, it was stuffed off in the back of a closet or kind of around the corner. And uh, it may not have even belonged to them. Right. They probably didn't, didn't even know it was there. <laughs> didn't even know it was there. It, it, it was, so he, uh, he gave me that. And, of course, it's a pump shotgun and as a – as a 10 year old, the thing just was brutal. So I didn't shoot that a whole lot. So, uh, it, uh, so firearms for me was, uh, was a hunting kind of thing. Uh, wasn't a lot of plinking. Uh, we didn't grow up with a lot of means. So it wasn't like I could go down to, uh, to the, lo to the local Western auto and buy a brick of 22 shells every week. Right. Um, so, so it, uh, um, so it was mostly just hunting and, uh, and, and mostly deer hunting. And then, uh, join the military and you know you move all around you don't get a lot of opportunities to or in in the late 70s early 80s at least i didn't get a lot of opportunity to go to shooting ranges and things like that and then that all changed when uh when i retired and came to valdosta so f-15 crew chiefs don't get to shoot all the time and no <laughs> it's uh no we don't uh they don't let us carry guns and we don't get to shoot so it's uh you qualify like once a year you shoot uh like 40 rounds through a uh through an m4 or an m16 at the time with a 22 long rifle conversion kit in it and it's like so Ugh. you know why bo why bother you know so um it um I was I wasn't one of those guys at the pointy end of the spear, so I didn't get to uh, I didn't get to shoot regularly. So it, uh, um, but it was fun, and um, it uh, when I became a controller, well, we didn't get to shoot very much either. So we we're not uh, we're not the gun toting door kickers that uh, right. that some of the other people in the military are. So it uh, uh, so there just wasn't that much opportunity. Yeah. You know, you had to you had to move all the time. And, uh, I don't have, I didn't have near the collection of guns that I have now. And it, um, you know, I wish I could have been like some of the kids that I know that start when they're 12, you know, and they're, 
their grandmasters or their masters in IDPA, <laughs> grandmasters in USPSA, you know, and they're 12 years old. Yep. These kids are going to rule the world. So it, uh, those were, those weren't opportunities that I had, but, uh, yeah. um, still well, been a lot of fun. Well, thank you for your service, by the way. I really do appreciate it. I know the audience does as well. Um, you and your audience were worth it. Um, do you remember how you got introduced to competitive shooting? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> a friend of mine was setting up a, um, a USPSA match on our local range. And it was like right after I joined, that's the part I don't remember. I don't remember who introduced me to the range and how I got involved in it, but <laughs> he said he's having this USPSA match. It was four stages or six stages in four bays. And, and I thought, well, this might be kind of interesting. And, uh, so uh, I uh, I signed up for it, and I thought, well, this is kind of cool. So I was talking to him about it. And I said, yeah, this is – I can do this. This is a lot of fun. So the next month, we went to Jacksonville and shot my first IDPA match, and uh, that was even more fun um, <laughs> It, it t- to me. Um, and uh, I started going regularly to Gateway uh, in Jacksonville to shoot, and um, I think it didn't go much more than about a year. And I said, I want to do this at our range and start having matches at our range. So I started looking in how to be, how to become a safety officer, how to, how to do all that stuff. And we used some of the stuff that the range already had for USPSA matches and, uh, then started building up our club and, and building up our, uh, our inventory of props, targets and walls and all that kind of stuff. And that's where we started. And it's been, um, uh, an ever progressing kind of thing from 2012. That's <laughs> pretty much the year we started. And this was Little River Sportsman's Association. That is correct. Little River Sportsman's Association in Valdosta, Georgia, cultural center of the known universe. <laughs> home to the uh, home to the uh, Sheepdog CCP Championship. Recently, you were uh, you were participating in. How did that go? What uh, how how was it your was, performance it was that day? Amazing. It was, a well, my performance was (laughs) insignificant because I had to work. (laughs) So uh, I was was more help than, uh, I shot one stage to prove I was there so I could get my points for nationals, but then past that, I had to work, but it was an amazing event. Um, uh, Rick Denny, I know you've talked to him on the show before, but he was an amazing match director, and uh, we ended up with 228 shooters um, over four days. Uh, a great staff. We had amazing help from the uh, Valdosta State University uh, Reserve Officer Training Course uh, cadets who helped uh, park and then helped, uh, paste and reset. Um, the match just flowed very, very smoothly, and uh, we were done every day by 3 o'clock. It was, uh, it was an amazing event. It was a lot of work, but it was an amazing event. Awesome. Now, wait, you had people there to paste and reset? Holy cow. Uh, we did, and we have had them uh, helping us for about the last year. They called us up by accident uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I guess. They were looking for a, a range that they had participated and done some exercise stuff in. And um, he said, are y'all going to charge us again this year? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, you, we were there last year. And I said, no, you weren't. And, oh, I've got the wrong place. Oh, whoa, 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 hold up a second. What do you want to do? Well, they wanted to go run around in the woods and uh, and do a graduation exercise for the year's uh, cadets. And uh, I said, we could do that. And, uh, well, how much would you charge us? We wouldn't charge you a thing. You're not using <laughs> electricity because we have none. You're not using our water because we have none. So <laughs> you're just using our land at night when the range is closed. Uh, all it's going to take is for one of us to be out there and for y'all not to hurt yourselves. Right. Well, we can do that. So, so they started coming out and doing those. And shortly after the first one, they said, what can we do for community service to help you guys out? No, oh, let me tell you what you can do. So <laughs> they started coming out just for our local matches, you know, five, six, eight of them at a time Oh wow! Uh, for three of our four matches a month. Uh, not, our, not all IDPA, uh, Summer Steel Challenge, uh, USPSA Steel Challenge. And some are um, a local steel match that we have, but they're pasting, resetting, resetting steel, painting steel in the steel challenge match, 
basically doing whatever it takes. That's then awesome. comes the sheepdog, and <laughs> they said, what do you need? We need parking, we need pasting, and we need resetting, and we need tearing down. And over the four days, it was 30 different cadets that came out and helped us out. And uh, I'm hoping we're a model for other clubs to go out and ask some of these um, groups that uh, for community service type events, because our group will tell you that the community service that they do is the most fun community service they've ever done. Because a lot <laughs> of times we let them shoot our guns. We have a program to where they can shoot our steel challenge matches, and we provide the guns and the ammo. So there's a lot we do for them, and uh, and of course, it's a ton for us. So um, that's it's fantastic. A, it's a great relationship. Uh, it's very mutually beneficial. That's awesome. That is tremendous. I know. I the only time I've seen anything like that was at the the first the very first sanctioned match I went to in North Carolina State championship back in 2013 and they had um i think it was a a local boy scout troop they came uh-huh. and it had poured absolutely poured the rain for a week leading up to the match and there were bays that were standing in water and there were the there uh-huh. were, there were the boy scouts in their right. boots out there you know replacing targets and then pasting targets and nobody ever had to walk beyond the you know, you, all you had That's to do awesome. was go and shoot at your points of cover, and you were done. <laughs> One of the things we didn't want to have, and, and, it, and you've seen it, and I've seen it, we've all seen it, is towards the end of the match, people are starting to get tired. They're starting to get, mm. uh, you know, the, they may not be shooting well, so they're, they're getting a little bit more focused to try to shoot better, and, and they're more focused on their match than going downrange and uh, pasting and resetting and um and you're hearing uh, match staff, the safety officers, need more pacers, need more pacers, right. they're screaming and hollering. Like, we, we wanted to avoid that completely. So um, I think some of the competitors during the Sheepdog did go down range and paced, and, uh, and we certainly appreciate that. But I didn't hear any safety officers going, we need more pacers. You know, so <laughs> that was one of the big things we were trying to avoid uh, uh, during the Sheepdog to, to make a more memorable experience for our competitors. Nice. So how long after... Um... <laughs> How long after you decided to bring IDPA to Little River before you guys decided we're going to host our own sanction match? Oh, oh uh, we started hosting matches in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't decide to host a sanction match until the Sheepdog was our first. Uh, and I was the assistant match director for the Sheepdog. My first sanction match will be uh, February 29th, our rolling on the river tier two match. Oh, that'd be the first one. That'd be the first one that I will ever be the match director for. All right. Well, we'll have to have you back on to uh, talk about that one. (laughs) It's been difficult getting, um, little river has been accused of being the Bermuda triangle of competition (laughs) because you have such large cities that are close. Uh, it made it difficult for folks to find a reason to travel the, 90 to 120 miles to 240 miles from Atlanta to come down and shoot it when they've got all those ranges right there in their own town. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it made it, it made it difficult. So, uh, uh, the sheepdog really opened up a lot of people's eyes as to our facilities. All 10 bays are real close together. You don't have to walk more than about 250 yards, uh, from bay one to bay 10. So you're not, uh, you're, you're not on a, uh, a, a hike to to get to right. some of the far back bays, like some of the, some of the matches we've been to, just because of the real estate of of the range. And I'm I'm not bad mouthing other ranges. It's just some of them just. But our action pistol range was specifically designed for competition. When we laid it out, we designed it strictly for competition. Range members can go in and use it if they want to, but we've got other pistol ranges and ranges and 22 ranges and shotgun ranges and all that stuff. Uh, elsewhere on the range, but we've got 10 action pistol bays and they are, uh, one right after another. Now your, your profile says that you're, if correct me, if I've got this wrong, the founder of Little River Sportsman's Association, is that right? No, that is not correct. Uh, Where did I Little see River that? Sportsman's Asso- I don't know, but Little River Sportsman's Association was founded in 1984, uh, by a group of, uh, individuals that was leasing some land and they put a 200-yard rifle range and a 50-yard pistol range uh, was the first two facilities we had. 
Okay. Then they dug a big old lake and used the dirt to uh, to build four uh, bays, uh, and they called it the Cowboy Range. And that's where uh, the, the competition started. Okay. And then two years ago, we logged the range and used those proceeds to reconfigure everything. We ended up with a 600-yard rifle range, 10 action pistol bays, a 22 range, three pistol ranges. So we reconfigured everything and uh, made the 200-yard range truly 200 yards. It was 188 before, and uh, we just did a lot of improvement. You can, you can see pictures of all of our facilities on our website, uh, uh, lrsa.info, but it's uh, it's been a lot of work. But that was two years ago, so we uh, it, it's pretty much brand new, and um, it's uh, I've still got pine trees that are less than two feet tall in the berm, so <laughs> it's uh, it, it we're working on it. So <laughs> hope to get some better grass next year. Although the grass held up great for the sheepdog, uh, it, um, it 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 was really a good surface to to use for a, a sanctioned match. And a lot of ranges have gravel, and some of them have mud, and you know you just kind of that, that's just kind of what you deal with, you know. Right. And uh, we wanted to have uh, have grass, so we mow it and manicure it, and and uh, we got a lot of compliments on the base. Nice. So getting back to your shooting, um, how long after uh, you got started in 2012? How long after that before you decided that? you were going to really get serious about this because you're now, you're now a master in CDP, a master in CCP and in bug of all things. So you started out (laughs) mastering the lower (laughs) capacity divisions. Right. And you're an expert in pretty much all the others except revolver. What, (laughs) right. How long, I mean, what was the transformation? Like you said, you said you, you, you loved IDPA, you fell in love with it, you jumped right in. How long, or what was the transformation like? What was the effort that it took to become a master in those divisions? And why those lower capacity divisions first? Was, was it just that particular, was it the 1911? Uh, no, actually, I, sh- I didn't shoot. Uh, I started shooting my 1911 uh, less than a year ago. Uh, oh, wow. I shot CDP. See, a lot of people think CDP is a 1911. CDP is not necessarily a 1911. CDP is a 45. And oh. when I started in competition, all of my semi-automatic guns, um, I had read some stories about Rob Latham and uh, his uh, sponsorship with uh, Springfield Armory and the XDM. And I started with an XDM 525 in 9mm, and it fit my hand perfectly. I had a good friend of mine who had been a competitive shooter for a lot of years said that's one of the best competition guns right out of the box would not have to do a lot to it. So, um, I decided to start with that. And, um, and then, uh, uh, all of my master classifications have been through the classifier. I know that's not the traditional or most desired way to do it. People want match bumps and it, uh, I wanted to do the best I could in the classifier. So, I classified and and it uh a match bump is great but it wasn't something that I I like the t- I like the classification of being a master. So right. um when I shot when I shot classifiers I shot them the best of my ability and uh, it's um I ended up uh, That's where uh the chips fell. fine as a master <laughs> uh, under the uh under the old way. <laughs> right. Uh the 5x5 five five is a little bit tougher for some in some respects to to, to match master but uh um but I was serious about it from kind of from the very beginning. Um, you know, a lot of people will go out and buy buy gear, and and I didn't necessarily do that. I wanted to do it smarter. Mm-hmm. So I went to some matches and found out what some of the better shooters were using, and and uh, got decent holsters and decent mag pouches, and uh, uh, kind of worked my way up through kind of slowly. And then I'd come across a different match and I'd want to shoot a different gun. And that's how I got into bug. And, um, but I was kind of serious about it all the way back to 2012. When I started the IDPA matches at, at little river, I was already pretty well sold. And then, um, it, uh, was able to start affording to, to go and fly and found out that if I'm going to shoot a match that I don't have to set up and I don't have to work it, I'm gonna have to go someplace else. So that's when I started flying and driving to uh, 
to other matches and uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to afford to do that and uh, it, uh, as a matter of fact my wife's getting the benefit of some of that and I told her it's like if you let me go as many times as I want to around the country and shoot matches I'll take you on four no kidding vacations a year and uh, once a quarter we'll go someplace and so she's getting the benefit of that we've been to Charleston, Asheville, here, Memphis, and um, uh, the beach in Cocoa Beach. So that's the five we've been to this year so far. Nice. So she's getting the benefit of that. Yeah, it's been, <laughs> she's enjoying it, and uh, I certainly am too because uh, it uh, that it makes it easy to just say, okay, I'm leaving Friday. I'll be back Sunday. <laughs> right. and, um, I mean, and if you're going to fly someplace to, to go to a match, it really doesn't matter how far away it is. It's it, if you're driving. I know we had people that drove from Maryland to the Sheepdog. You know, they're saying thirteen, fourteen hours driving. It's like, oh no. <laughs> if it's more than six hours, I'm not driving. Uh, you know, so uh, I flew to Memphis. So uh, from from Valdosta, Georgia. So it's uh, um, you know, the the uh, Space Coast down in Central Florida, I'll drive to, and others, the Georgia State, I'll drive to. But uh, I don't mind flying to other matches. Gotcha. Now you've. Uh... Recently, I've run across you shooting PCC, and and rather than, uh, than yes. <laughs> and rather than take up the traditional standard AR style rifle, you stuck with the platform that you started out with that XD as the basis yes, sir. for a MechTech PCC. Tell us about that and how, how you found it. CCU. Uh, Honestly, I don't remember how I found it, but when I found out that it fit a – one of the platforms was an XDM, I thought, well, let me look into this. And I got one, and it swung so easy. It moved so easy. I put a nice red dot on it, and I thought, I can work this. And uh, so I started I started shooting PCC. One of the most fun stages I had was at the uh, this year's Carolina Cup. It was a kind of a shoot house, and you got to go down a hallway, and there was – Doors and openings on the left, doors and openings on the right, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of an ambidextrous rifle shooter because of, uh, of my eye dominance mm -hmm. and only being able to close one eye without uh, without closing them both. So it's kind of a deformity that, that kind of works for me. I'm right-handed by nature, but I shoot rifles left-handed, so it kind of oh, works wow. both ways. And I go hauling off down this hallway <laughs> – and left and right and left and right and left and right and uh, and I saw some guys struggle uh, with their weak side shooting, uh, trying to get around a corner, and, and I don't have that problem. And the gun, uh, it swings well, and uh, so I put a laser on it for uh, uh, for the PCC Nationals, uh, and ended up walking away with uh, with most accurate uh, at the PCC Nationals in Talladega this year. That was pretty cool. Are you now sponsored by MechTech? I am sponsored by MechTech uh, Systems. They uh, uh, we inked a deal uh, several months ago, and uh, it's uh, it, it's a lot of fun representing them and uh, taking my gun to to matches and people looking at it going, "What is that?" And me being able to tell them, it's like, "This is something. This is and this is not something that that they coined or that I coined. This is actually something that the the advertisement folks at USPSA some years back coined." And they kept it. It is the world's greatest pistol accessory because you can just take the grip off your pistol as long as it's one of the platforms that they support. And you can put that upper on there and, and you've got a rifle. And uh, it's, uh, it is it is amazing. It, it, the, the manual of arms, how to operate it, is a little bit different than your typical um, PCC, your AR platform. Mm -hmm. But once you get used to it um, – a friend of mine and I were shooting our PCCs uh, a few days ago, and I went to reload his PCC, and I stuck the magazine <laughs> where I normally stick it, which is in the pistol in grip. The grip. And I was like, nope, it doesn't go there. <laughs> it's, uh, it goes a little bit further forward. So once you get used to it, it's uh, it's great, and uh, I, I love shooting it. It's uh, it, the, the big thing for me is it doesn't have that springy AR feel that mm. that I remember all the way back from my early days in the Air Force. ARs just had that springy, clangy buffer spring feel <laughs> right. that a mech tech doesn't. That great big block of uh, of steel bolt as it slides back is just a very solid feel, and it really is nice. I really like it. What's the um What's the most valuable lesson you think you've learned over the years? Since you started in 2013, the 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 biggest lesson learned in shooting IDPA. Stay in the game, Millie. 
uh, I was listening to one of your other guests and he talked about uh, his mental game. And uh, that was a, a, a pretty much a weak point in my game because I, I get, I get frustrated at times and I get, um, uh, uh, I get frustrated with my performance when I don't do well. Right. Uh, it, it's pretty cool when I do, but it, you got to try to seek out that that even keel throughout an entire match. And one of the things that helped me a lot, uh, there's a book by an Olympic shooter um, called With Winning in Mind. And and I read that book several times. Lanny Basham. And uh, yes. And uh, he talks a lot about the mental game and uh, – you know, and I'm not perfect at it by no stretch. I'm still working on it, but uh, it's, uh, you know, when you're almost 60 years old, you're kind of, <laughs> you know, I don't have the eye and hand reflexes these 12 year olds do. And <laughs> so there's, there's a, there's a limit to how much better I can get. But if I can, if I can keep myself mental in the game, uh, I do a lot better. Um, it was, uh, uh, it, it was a, an eye opening experience, it, you know, you can't do much about uh, uh, the things that happen to you when you, you're almost 60 years old, but uh, you can keep your, yourself mentally in the game by not uh, by, by forgetting what happened just a second ago and focusing on what's next. And uh, it uh, it's uh, that that's been a huge part. And there's been some some great competitors that have that have uh, helped me along the way and and gave me advice about. Uh, you know, uh, about how to do stage prep as far as focusing on your mental game when you walk up to the, uh, when you're in the on deck circle mm. and, and getting it, you know, not a lot of chit chat, matter of fact, not any chit chat, <laughs> focusing on the stage, focusing on what you're doing. I mean, you're, you're, there to, you're there to do something. You're mm. not there to, it's not a big social event. It can be a social event later, but right now they're trying to, um, uh, you're, you're trying to perform, you're trying to do well. And, and that takes some mental concentration. And it takes some effort. And, uh, the older you get, the more of that effort it takes. <laughs> You'll figure that out one of these days. <laughs> hey, I'm not that far behind you. <laughs> <clears throat> it's, it's a rapid progression though, when you get to my age. <laughs> well, as we wrap up, uh, what is it over the years that keeps you doing this what is it about idpa that is fun for you that you love so much that that hooked you from day one and keeps you coming back and and trying to get better and devoting as much time as you do to to your local club what is it about idpa that you love oh my gosh that's the easiest question in the world for me (laughs) like i said i'm almost 60 years old i can compete and shoot okay I can do that. We had distinguished seniors that were in their seventies and, and, and maybe older at the sheepdog. Uh, we had guys with three XL t-shirts. So this, this, you can do this sport even when you can't do 18 holes of golf or you can't go out and do flag football. There, there is no marathon runs in IDPA. So right. this is a sport that as I get older, I can still compete. Uh, you know, maybe not to the level of, uh, of the 12 year olds that don't expect to. Um, uh, <laughs> but if I can, uh, if I can, if I can perform to my level, then I'm happy. Um, whether it's IDPA or steel challenge or any of the other shooting sports that I compete in, um, it, shoot, the shooting sports is something I can do as I get older. And that's what attracts me to it. Uh, I played racquetball when I was in the air force. Um, you know, I played football in high school and, you know, you get to the point you can't do that anymore. Right. Uh, IDPA is not bad on my knees. Um, uh, it's not bad on my elbows. Um, I can, I can do this. I see me doing this for a number of years going forward. Cause it's, it's something I can enjoy doing and it's, it's trigger time and my gosh, it's shooting guns. <laughs> How much more fun can that be? Absolutely. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's uh it idpa is a lot of fun but i don't have to you know i'm not in three gun where i have to run oh my gosh i saw a friend of mine she was doing a <laughs> she was doing a three gun match and she shot up shot her pistol and then she or shot her rifle and then she had to run like 200 yards down range to grab her shotgun it's like oh my gosh <laughs> you know it's like get me a wheelchair by halfway down so we don't have to do that you know so it's more uh, I didn't say it's a handicap sport, but I don't have to run so far. So I can really put forth 
whatever energy I got into it, because I know it's not going to be, you know, a, a triathlon uh, right. to get downrange. So that that's something I really enjoy doing, and uh, and it's something as long as my health holds out, uh, then I then I can see me doing it for quite a while. I see a lot of older guys, a lot older than me, out there doing it, yep. and that's encouraging. It is. Well, Lee, thank you so much for for everything you're doing. It was great to get to meet you this year. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show and and happy new year to you. And I I look forward to uh, seeing you on the range in 2020. Happy new year to you as well. Merry Christmas. And we hope you uh, make it to next year's sheepdog match. We certainly missed you this year and uh, say hi to you and yours. All right. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your support. Thank you to our guest for coming on the show. And thank you to our awesome sponsor, Matt Shark, for making this entire season possible. If you would, please take a minute to check out our website, Unload Podcast. Um, Lots of cool um, previous episodes are there. Links to all sorts of, of great information. Just check out the guest list as well. Uh, Join the Facebook group, too, if you want to connect with other fans and get updates on the latest news. You can find that at unloadpodcast.com slash Facebook. Check out our YouTube channel. We've got a lot of cool videos there at unloadpodcast.com slash YouTube. And if you'd like to support the show personally, consider becoming a patron just a dollar a month at patreon.com slash unload. And um, for your support, I'll send you out a sticker and you'll have my undying gratitude for your help. If you or someone you know would make an interesting guest for a future episode, you can contact me at unloadpodcast.com. Just uh, go to the contact button in the menu at the top of the page and uh, send me a message. Or you can send me an email at Lloyd, L-L-O-Y-D, at unloadpodcast.com. Tune in again next Thursday for another episode of Unload and Show Clear, powered by Matt Sharp. We are a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Be sure to check out all of the other pro-freedom podcasts at selfdefenseradio.com dot net.